Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Please find a seat. Uh, my name is Paul Fitzgerald. I, I work here at the university. <laughs> I am the president. Um, and I want to thank all of our guests who are here in person, uh, as well as those uh, zooming in via live stream uh, for this amazing and wonderful event. Not the first time uh, that we've had uh, leaders uh, of the Irish Republic here on campus, but a wonderful new chapter in a long, long history. Um, we as a university like to be a place uh, where ideas are shared, especially where visions of a better society are shared. Uh, our little motto is uh, change, change the world from here. The longer version of it was educating hearts and minds to change the world from here. And that's what we're going to do this evening. Touch hearts and touch minds. Um, I have some questions uh, that I will pose later in this event that were submitted by you and others when they registered for the, for the evening. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for insightful and thoughtful questions. I now have the honor of introducing our guest for tonight, Mary Lou McDonald. Mary Lou McDonald is the leader of Sinn Féin and the Teuchte Dale, a member of the lower house of the Irish legislature for the Dublin Central constituency. And if you have any questions about sports teams <laughs> and the dominance of Dublin over Cork and Donegal, she is here to answer those. Uh, Sinn Féin is the largest party in the Doyle Iron, the lower house and principal chamber of the Irish legislature. And Mary Lou MacDonald is the first woman in the history of the state to lead the official opposition. She is proud uh, to represent the people of Dublin Central, where she has the reputation for hard work and champion, championing the needs of her constituents, both locally, nationally, and of course for advancing causes internationally. In 2018, when she took over the leadership of Sinn Féin from Gary, uh, Jerry Adams, she was asked uh, how she would fill his shoes, and she replied, I'll bring my own shoes. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Mary McDonald. So, um, Gurumila Mahakut, uh, Paul, our uh, son, Fal Shamorsha, thank you so much, Father, uh, for such a warm uh, introduction. Can I say I'm just uh, delighted to be uh, with you here. It's my first time in San Francisco and on the West Coast. Ooh. Uh, it will not be my last. Um, and I've been told that uh, San Francisco is often referred to every, as everybody's favorite uh, city. Uh, I've only been here a few days, but I can see why that is indeed the case. It's my first time visiting your rolling hills, and your streets are, however, very, very familiar to me because we have seen them so often on television and in the movies. <laughs> So this helps. So I've, I've yet to experience the famous San Francisco fog, but by God, uh, California, you are hot stuff. Um, and I doubt that I will get the opportunity to become one of the faithful down at uh, Levi's Stadium, but I am finding my way around your incredible, vibrant, and really very, very beautiful city. It's especially nice to be here with you at the beginning of fall because that is, of course, a time of the year when the world, in perpetual hope and optimism, sheds the past and awakens to the road ahead. And as our children head back to classrooms, we reaffirm our responsibility to shape a better world for them to inherit. And this is a universal responsibility that unites the human family. It belongs to all of us, to workers and families trying to get by, to communities coming together in kindness, to those in academia 
advancing our knowledge and our understanding, and of course to those of us in political leadership trying to chart a new way forward. Our responsibility to build a better future connects us, particularly in times of challenge and adversity. And as we face an unprecedented cost of living crisis that is global, Russia's criminal invasion of the Ukraine, and the very real and present climate crisis, we stand at a pivotal point in history, a moment where the decisions that we take in the here and now will reverberate without a doubt through the next decades and far beyond. And sometimes the decisions we have to make are complex, they can be complicated, but sometimes they're very, very simple. To choose togetherness over division, compassion over cruelty, friendship over animosity, and to choose hope over fear. Mark Twain, who worked as a journalist in this city, once wrote, courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear. It's not the absence of fear. And I think that's a really powerful and compelling message as we continue our journey, carrying baggage of uncertainty and aspiration in equal measure, that we choose courage. The enduring task of improving our world in the here and now and leaving it better than we found it calls on us to be brave, to believe, and to succeed. It calls on us to bring light into dark places and to live up to our duties to each other. Autumn, fall, is also a time where nature demonstrates her endurance. And there is no better time of the year to reflect on the very enduring and special quality of the great friendship between Ireland and the United States of America. It is a bond that has stood the test of time and flourishes today. The stories of our nations are inextricably linked. And while the connection of our two countries dates back centuries, and our ties are woven through our mutual fight for independence from the British Empire, it is true to say that the intensity of that bond was forged in particular in the tragedy of Ireland's great hunger, our famine on Goethe Moor. Between 1845 and 1855, approximately a quarter of Ireland's population fled starvation, and many came to these shores in search of sanctuary and a new life. And there are friends with us, families here, and that is how you landed to this wonderful place. Later, Annie Moore, a 17-year-old girl from County Cork, sailed past the Statue of Liberty in January 1892, and she became the first of 12 million immigrants to come through Ellis Island. The inscription on Lady Liberty reads, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be, breathe free. And from the issuing of that declaration call to the present day, the Irish have come to these shores seeking a brighter horizon. The journey across the Atlantic continued for generations. We came not forced by hunger or oppression, but seeking work and a chance to realize the potential that economic circumstances at home would not allow. The Irish have seen the US as a haven of opportunity and hope, and we will be forever grateful for the friendship of the American people. In equal measure, we are incredibly proud of the immense contribution that the Irish make to this great nation in the arts, in music, in culture, in politics and activism, in sports, in business. The hallmark of Irish effort, determination and genius is seen far and wide. And that innate characteristic of the Irish to rise to a challenge, to overcome, chimes so easily with the American and ideals of liberty and prosperity. It's a connection that crafted a natural sense of belonging for the Irish in America, and that affiliation has undeniably strengthened and enriched American society. In his address to Dáil Éireann, to the Dáil, the parliament to which I'm elected, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy really captured the essence of our relationship. He said, and so, 
It is that our two nations, divided by distance, have been united by history. No people ever believe more deeply in the cause of Irish freedom than the people of the United States. And no country contributed more to building my own than your sons and daughters. They came to our shores in a mixture of hope and agony. And I would not underrate the difficulties of their course once they arrived to the United States. They left behind hearts, fields, and a nation yearning to be free. It is no wonder that James Joyce describes the Atlantic as a bowl of bitter tears. And an earlier poet wrote, they are going, 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 and we cannot bid them stay. When I made my journey across the Atlantic on Sunday last, I reflected on how Ireland has the Ireland I left has changed so much from the country that Annie Moore left in the dead of winter 130 years ago. And it is indeed also a very different place to the country that thousands of young people left in the 1980s in search of work and a better life. Friends, Ireland has changed and is changing. In this new decade, a modern vision for Ireland stands before us, a vision shaped by all the talent, potential, and opportunity that pulses through our island. And our people respond with enthusiasm and energy, and we will achieve the Ireland that can be. Votes in favour of marriage equality in 2015, the repeal of the Eighth Amendment in 2018, were signals of the people's appetite for real progressive change. They were the signposts of a generation rising with confidence and courage to win the Ireland denied to our parents, our grandparents, to your grandparents, your great-grandparents. It's the Ireland denied to those who came to America to build a home away from home. And this generation is determined to reach our destiny, to right the wrongs of the past. 100 years ago, Ireland was partitioned under the threat of immediate and terrible war by the British. That same year, the great revolutionary Constance Markievicz visited San Francisco to rally America in support of the Irish cause. She knew that partition meant not only the partition of territory, but that it fundamentally damaged the fabric of Irish nationhood. And so it came to pass. Partition resulted in the creation of two reactionary states on the island of Ireland, the North, an orange state was a place of brutal oppression and discrimination. Nationalists, Catholics, Gaels were excluded from power, denied jobs, denied employment, and basic civil rights. And in the South, we had a deeply conservative state that kept women down, marginalized ordinary working people, and turned its back on progressive politics. A century on from that disastrous act of political vandalism, Ireland is transformed. Today, we reach for full nationhood, for the fair and equal society our people so desperately want. And ultimately, we reach for the reunification of our country. And make no mistake, seismic generational change is underway in Ireland. And Sinn Féin is an important part of this current of optimism, positivity, and hope. The Northern Assembly election in May saw the vote of a generation as Sinn Féin emerged as the largest party. And our colleague, deputy leader of Sinn Féin, Michelle O'Neill, was elected as first minister designate in a state that was designed to ensure that that could never, ever happen. And yet, it did. The people voted for progress. The people voted for progress, for a government for all, an executive that rolls up its sleeves, gets the job done. And that is exactly what we intend to deliver. So the DUP, unionism, must end the boycott of democracy and of the political institutions and work to form a government for all of the people. 
May's unprecedented breakthrough came on the back of that historic 2020 general election in the South. And there the people voted for change and Sinn Féin won the popular vote. And we now lead an opposition that stands up for people and presents alternative policies to the failed ones of the past. We have a duty to represent those who know that a better, stronger, and fairer Ireland is possible. And it's a job that we take very seriously. And I am very proud to be the first woman leader of the opposition. So now the prospect of Sinn Féin leading government north and south is, is now very real. And of course, the only reason to be in government is to change things for the better. Sinn Féin wants to be in government because we are ambitious for Ireland. We're ambitious for our people. We know that we have everything that we need to build a new, united, and prosperous Ireland. The economic and social opportunities are immense, and we want to see them realized. We refuse to be held back by those who are tired and out of ideas. We are determined to rise to new challenges with fresh thinking and with new leadership. We want to bring the vision and the energy to capitalize on Ireland's attributes, a young, educated workforce, the clear potential to build a dynamic, innovative economy fueled by high productivity jobs and good wages. So now is not a time to tread water in the presence of great opportunity. Today, we're no, under no illusions, for example, how important it is to be able to access affordable energy. Energy, after all, is driving the cost of living crisis right across the world. We're under no illusions that the climate emergency requires a smart, planned change in how we produce energy, and that countries need to work together to make this happen. Ireland can be. Ireland will be a leader in the production of clean, renewable energy. Our abundant wind resource, particularly off the West Coast, for those of you from Mayo and from, from Galway and beyond, puts us in a position where our small island can be a, an international hub for renewables. And there exists a really exciting opportunity, particularly in the development of our offshore capacity and green hydrogen. We can play a role in decarbonizing the economies of Europe and developing our renewable sector. We can utterly transform our economy. We can create sustainable jobs, energy independence, and real prosperity for the future. So this opportunity must be seized and maximized with real purpose and determination. That is what Sinn Féin will do in government. Past failures to plan and grasp Ireland's opportunities came with a very high and unacceptable cost. And we cannot and we will not see another generation left behind. Today, People in their 20s and 30s are likely to be the first generation in Ireland to be worse off than their parents. That's not right. That's not acceptable. It's only natural that each generation stands and succeeds on the shoulders of their parents. That's the bedrock of human progress. Here, the American dream is founded on the promise that if you work hard enough, you get ahead, you'll be able to build a decent life for yourself and your family. That's an Irish value, too. But we currently have a generation that works very, very hard to get ahead, to build a good life, and yet their goals and aspirations are pushed further away from them. Locked out of opportunity, locked out particularly of home ownership. That can't continue, because every generation must advance. Each generation must thrive. Each generation must have the chance to make it, and that principle will be the driving force behind Sinn Féin in government if we are given that opportunity. Our potential is far too great to be squandered again. We need to drive progress and opportunity. And our young people deserve a future in which they have a real stake. Be in no doubt that Irish young people will continue to want to come to the United States of America, if that there is no doubt. They'll come on their J-1 visas, for example, to work in the bars and the restaurants, the vineyards, 
and to have that American experience. Others will come in their chosen professions and trades. Many will come and stay and build their lives here. However, there is no place like home. And every Irish person must also know that they can have a future at home in Ireland. So government in Ireland, all of us in political life must rise to the challenge of affordable housing, of decent work and wages, to make that a very real choice for people. Friends, we now approach the 25th anniversary of our peace accord, the Good Friday Agreement, an agreement that the United States played a central role in bringing about. The Good Friday Agreement demonstrates how much we can achieve when we act in common purpose. It shows that we can fix that which is broken, that we can remember, that we can reconcile, and that we can start anew. Since 1998, we have built the peace. And now we look to write the next chapter, the reunification of Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement provides for referendums on Irish unity, and I believe that these referendums will happen in this decade. So we must prepare for that day. The people of Ireland are ready. We are ready to be a united nation once again. And unity is the very best idea for the future of Ireland and the greatest opportunity that we face. This is an exciting, positive time, and it dem demands energy and action. It demands that both the Irish and British governments wake up and catch up to the fact that the people of Ireland are choosing a future of unity and togetherness. We won't be dragged backwards by a toxic Brexit, or by the relentless full frontal attacks on the Good Friday Agreement by Tory British Prime Minister. And as Prime Minister Liz Truss enters Downing Street, she must now break, break with the bad faith agenda of her predecessors. She must change direction. She must end the unilateral actions and respect international law. We need to see a recommitment to the Good Friday Agreement, support for the restoration of the political institutions, and an end to the game playing around the Irish Protocol. Can I say that the reiteration by President Biden of the need for good faith negotiations and implementation of the protocol in his call with the new British Prime Minister is very, very welcome. It is further evidence of the US determination to protect the peace and to protect the Good Friday Agreement. So the people of Ireland will not be bully, bullied. We will not be coerced or knocked off our path to a few brighter future to suit British interests. Those days are long gone. It's now time. <laughs> it's now time to reassert the primacy of democracy, the vision of a future beyond division, a future that matches the hopes of Irish people from all communities. Nelson Mandela once said, in order to build our nation, we must all exceed our own expectations. That's the very essence for me of nation building and leadership, exceeding our own expectations, stretching ourselves to reach out beyond the trenches of the past, to see the light of a new dawn breaking. The people of Ireland see that new dawn breaking, and the people of the United States have walked that journey with us every step of the way. You have kept faith. You have kept faith with the cause of Ireland. And I'm asking that you keep faith now, as Ireland walks the final length of that road to reunification, to full freedom, and full nationhood. A good friend once said to me, if you want to change the world, start by changing your own corner of it. And then look to your friends and your neighbours for their support. The people of Ireland are changing our corner of the world. We look to make Ireland a better place for all, a home where you can realise your aspirations and ambitions to live a good and decent life. And I know that this is something the people of the US want for their own families. The friendship 
of the United States of America has meant so much to our progress, a progress that is not yet complete, but we are getting closer every single day. I believe that special relationship between our nations will endure and strengthen further still. The legacy, the achievements of our bond has built a bridge of hope and freedom across Joyce's bowl of tears. It connects our shared history and provides a pathway to a shared future. I quoted John F. Kennedy earlier, but I will conclude, Paul, with the words of his brother, Robert. He said, all of us might wish at times that we lived in a more tranquil world, but we don't. And if our times are difficult and perplexing, so are they challenging and filled with opportunity. So we face many challenges, but we will prevail. We will prevail by working together for positive change, for opportunity and prosperity. We will prevail by keeping faith, each of us, to our own truth and to the journey for Irish freedom that began so very, very long ago. This is a future that we will achieve together. It's a future that belongs to us all, belongs to each and every one of us. It's a future work worth working really, really hard to achieve. Gurumila Mahagwiv Galer. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. McDonald. Uh, very, very intriguing, important ideas, uh, many, many opportunities, but also many challenges. So as you, so I, I lived in Germany in the mid 80s, uh, when Germany was also you know, seeking reunification. And uh, it was a long and difficult process, um, and, but An Angela Merkel was finally the one who I think brought the whole thing, brought the nation back together. Uh, could you talk to us a bit about what would the steps be for a reunification? Or what would the timeline look like? You mentioned a decade. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what's, some, what's some of the deeper work that will have to take place? So, Paul, you instance uh, Germany there. And you know, in, in any reunification process, you look, to, you look for compar comparisons, don't you, to say, well, you know, what happened in Germany? And of course, there are lessons to be learned from the German experience. I think the primary one is this, that actually change can happen a whole pile quicker than you anticipate. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there's a story of uh, the European leaders uh, in a huddle meeting talking about what about Germany and what happens next. And, Meanwhile, that very weekend, the wall came down because the street and public opinion was so far ahead of what was kind of a reticence or a concern or, or a conservatism within official politics. So in terms of the process now, Paul, the first thing that, that, that I, I, I am saying consistently is that preparation needs to start now. The Irish government cannot imagine, the British government cannot imagine that they can forever stall in the face of obvious change. And I, I instance the, the election uh, in May when Michelle O'Neill becomes uh, First Minister designate, and as I say, in a state that was specifically designed to make sure that could never happen. Mm. I mean, that was not in the script at all. And, and yet it happened. I could instance other elections, a whole succession of elections, which demonstrate clearly that the unionist majority upon which the six county state and the partition, that's gone. It's gone and it's not coming back. That's the truth and the reality. So from a process point of view, the first political truth that needs to be faced is that that is changed. And that the question now of the border particularly uh, post-Brexit, which we might or might not talk about. I know some people, their faces glaze over when you, <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, but certainly in a post-Brexit scenario, um, you know, th that th the viability of the border and of partition is, is now over. So we need to prepare. We have said to, to the government uh, in Dublin 
that, that really Dublin needs to hop the ball first. Okay, the sovereign Irish government needs to make the first move. Um, and, and the first move needs to be about creating an official space in which the conversation can happen. And when I say that, I mean not just those of us who passionately believe that reunification is the best outcome for Ireland, but also for people who, for whom reunification would not be their first choice. You know, for unions who will go and campaign to retain the link with Britain. They too have to have a space in that conversation. So that needs to happen in, in our estimation as a matter of, um, of urgency. That conversation, that sense of, of planning. And then we need to figure out what transition from a partitioned Ireland to a re reunified Ireland, what does that look like? And technically, how do we make that happen? How do we marry up educational systems, health systems? What are the big opportunities that are uh, arising? So th that's about people within the system and people within political leadership rolling up our sleeves. But let me just give you this one reflection. If there was a silver lining to Brexit, and Brexit was a disaster, frankly, in, in our view. But if there was or is a silver lining, it's this. It's, it's changed the dynamic, the trading and economic relationship on the island. So north, south, all island trade now has spiked, I mean, to record levels. Supply chains, as they're called, the lingos, supply chains, have become more integrated. It's actually forced the Irish economy north and south much, much closer and a much closer integration. So whereas we have time to plan and we need to take the time for plan, we don't have time to sit on our laurels either because change is now underway as we are speaking. Brexit happened, that created one dynamic. Other things can happen that will move the whole, the whole process uh, forward, uh, that can move things forward in a very dramatic and speedy way. And I'm conscious, by the way, as the leader of Sinn Féin, this is not a Sinn Féin project solely. I, mean, I think it's really important that we absolutely understand this. This is a national project. So everybody needs to be involved. And as I was saying to some folks earlier at the, at the reception, it's very important that the international community, the United States of America, Europe and beyond, and particularly our global Irish family, people with Irish heritage, people with, with long history with, with Ireland, are also part of that, of that conversation. I'm grateful to uh, Professor Keely McBride, who uh, teaches uh, Northern Ireland and takes students over there every summer and uh, gave a few questions also for me to pose. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits, uh, said, you know, educatio pueris renovatio mundi. The education of children is the renewal of the world. Uh, but 90% of children in Northern Ireland go to schools that are segregated according to religious affiliation. Clearly, education plays a very large role in developing this future Ireland, this vision of this wonderful future. How have you thought about how to change the educational system in Northern Ireland in accordance with your goals for the future? So yes, this is, um, this is a very, very good and very pertinent uh, question. Um, and it's something that wider Irish society, actually not just in the north, but the island as a whole has kind of grappled with. The place of religious, faith-based education, where does that sit uh, on the island? And of course in the north, because of the, the conflict, uh, because of the nature of the state, it was, I mean, it was established on the basis of a sectarian headcount. So anybody who scratches their head and wonders, why is there a sectarian problem in the north of Ireland? Well, that's the reason, because the state was designed um, in that way. So I, I think we need to do a number of things. I think certainly the integrated uh, models of uh, education together, north and south, shared education, needs to be supported. I think it's, it's a popular choice for lots of families. I also know that for others, they will wish to maintain ethos-based uh, uh, religion. And interestingly, when, when the, in the south, in the 26 counties, there is a special protection for ethos-based 
education because there was a concern that a Protestant minority would be worried that the Catholic Church, no, no offense, Paul, um, uh, would monopolize that entire space. And families thought, no, we want, we want that space to, you know, to have a say in how our, our kids are educated. So whilst the, the, the goal of integration is absolutely a worthy one, and I absolutely support that and where it comes from, there has to be a bit of a reality check as well in what parents and families and communities will want. So this is one of these conversations that needs to happen. But let me, let me make this point. Do you see, if we want to really do something about education and really give every child, whether you're on the Shankill or the Falls or whether you're in Ballymun or in the inner city communities that I represent, resource it properly. I would have a concern that in getting wrapped up in debates about models and what's the right model or the wrong one, we lose sight of the fact that you need the right pupil-teacher ratio. You need the right kind of resources going into schools, all schools, including the schools in which poor working class kids go to. So what we can agree, there are, there are uh, complexities around the model. And we need to talk about those things and get it right. But there's no complexity around the need to resource. That, that's a clear-cut uh, necessity. In the North, academic selection is massively problematic. Massively problematic. And our, our friend, our dear friend, Martin McGuinness, lost to us too soon as Minister for Education, took that on. And so you, you don't you know, segregate uh, in terms of ability, children at a very young age and really devastate some kids in terms of their, their, their belief in themselves and, and their educational opportunity. So it's multi-layered. The issue of integrated education is one important conversation and one important strand, but it's not the only one. And I think it's important to reflect that. I also say as a dub, as someone from the, the free state from the south, like, we, we shouldn't be getting up on our high horse saying, oh my goodness, look at them with their segregated education. Still in the place that I, I went to a Catholic school, you know, um, in, in the places where we live, most of the schools still have a connection with an ethos patron. So it's a, it's a big conversation, and it's not just about the North, although there's a particular texture and a particular particular sensitivity to it there, but it's a great question, yeah. So University of San Francisco, our students are about 35% Catholic. You know, we are really home for all religions yeah. and have a vision of our community as you know, being stronger and richer because of the diversity of these worldviews. In, in your future vision uh, of Ireland, you know, uh, does it remain a Catholic state or does it really become a state with a, with a history th that is very much built out of the Catholic tradition but is a home for, for all people? It has to be that. And, you know, so you know, you know the old slogan that was home rule is Rome rule? Ian Paisley liked it, yeah. <laughs> the late Ian Paisley. It was, it, was a, it was a slogan, and I, I think, you know, it kind of got our backs up, you know, as Irish people saying, well, you know, what's that? I, I think we need to be real here and say, in many respects, home rule did turn out to be Rome rule. We, we, just need to, we just need to say that out loud. And that's in no way to disrespect people of faith, Catholic people far from it, but it is to assert very clearly that for society to work, as you have said, Paul, your vision of education, but the vision of wider society, you have to do two things. You have to respect and acknowledge belief and values and philosophy. That's really important. You have to have space for that in your society. But there has to be clear blue water between that and the state and the government and the absolute obligation for the state, the government, the new society to cherish and uphold everybody and not to be captive to a single theological view of the world. In the North, very dramatically, a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. We know how that led to. Blatant discrimination, blatant, blatant exclusion 
pogroms against uh, people from partition onwards uh, periodically because they were not wanted. We experience that, we live that, that will not have a repetition um, in the Ireland of the future. So we, we need this very wide canvas. Uh, things need, to, it, it, and it needs to be a home for one and for all. And the way that you do that in, in our view is you recognize the fundamental democratic, civil, and human rights of citizens. And then in your constitution, in your law, in your agencies of government, you vindicate them. And we should, we should, we need to aim high in terms of, of, of what, that, what that looks like. But yes, that is, um, I know, a value of the Jesuits, that, that, that worldview. And that's certainly, that's the democratic way to, to move forward. I remember, by the way, the first time I had said on television this thing of um, home rule was Roman, the, the shock among certain unionists and companies. Oh my god, she said it. It was said out loud. And I, I think it's important to say because we need to be, we're, we're about, we're embarking on something truly historic and monumental. Mm. And you only build new on the basis of actually facing some unpalatable truths and realities. And as, as a Republican woman, as an Irish nationalist, as a committed and passionate uh, Irish proponent of Irish unity, I am prepared to do just that. And I think all of us collectively need to take our courage in our hands and say, right, let's be honest with each other. And let's be on the, on the level with the, each other. I'm trying to get the Americanisms in. <laughs> uh, let's try and be on the level with each other in terms of what the collective experience was and, and now what we need to do to put those things right. Put those things right. Hmm. Um, does, does Sinn Féin have kind of tactics and strategies already thought through about reaching out to the unionists in the six counties in the north and you know, helping them to share this vision of a, a hope-filled future? One of the things that always strikes me when people say about you know, Sinn Féin and unionism, and you see, we're, we're organized. We're a national uh, organization, so much more so than colleagues from other political parties in the Dáil, we actually have relationships with unionism because we work with them in the executive, in the assembly, in councils, all across the six counties. Now, we don't always hit it off famously. <laughs> uh, we don't always agree far from it. But those relationships and dynamics um, are there. So on the basis of that experience, I would say two things. Firstly, yes, that reaching out is extremely important, like absolutely crucial. And that happens in small ways, unnoticed ways, casual ways even, day in, day out, day in, day out. And we need to build um, on that. But I would also say that we have to not patronize unionism. We're not going to talk them out of their political view. Unionists believe in the union with Britain for all sorts of historic uh, reasons. And perhaps we might regard misguided reasons of you know, self-advancement or whatever. But that is their view. And in all likelihood, that view for lots of people is not going to change. And when the referendum happens, unionism will campaign for the union. And nobody should be surprised by that. We need to be relaxed and, again, real uh, about about all of that. But the building of relationships then has to be on the basis of respect for the integrity of that position, but also an ability to invite people into seeing and agreeing that whatever the, di the differences or whatever our past is, that actually we have a future that we have to build together because we live on the, we live on the, on the same island. So this is something that we talk about a lot. This is something also that is also changed and changing. Let me give you just a small example of it. We had a by-election. Um, I, I think it was in West Tyrone. In any event, we were out, out on the beat, harassing unfortunate, unsuspecting, decent uh, members of the electorate, knocking on their doors and talking to them and so on. So I was actually with Michelle uh, O'Neill. It was in Tyrone. And, we came across a, a young group uh, of activists who were unionists with the small U, but they were out doing their thing, and they stopped me and said, how are you, how are you? And we had a, a chat. And at that time, there was a referendum in play south of the border. 
and all the all the campaigners south that were going around with their yes t-shirts and their sweatshirts and all of this and these kids were wearing yes t-shirts and sweatshirts so what that told you was that that big debate was actually a national debate mm -hmm. and that those young people were watching it very carefully and felt that they had a stake in the outcome of it. And I just said, that is very revealing psychologically about where things are at. So for lots of perhaps older people like ourselves who might be sort of stuck in their ways or very set in their views, don't miss that there's a whole new generations of people coming, and that's not how they see the world. It's just not how they see the world because the world now is so connected, do you know? And, and the island is so small. Sometimes I laugh, the way we carry on, you'd imagine we were Australia or something. Like, <laughs> like seriously, like we're a tiny, gorgeous, amazing island, but we're small, we're an island people. So it's not as if we're so exotic and far flung. Sure, you're never more than about four or five people away from anyone, and truth be told, you know? So right now you're sitting in Nancy Pelosi's congressional yes, district. I am. And when, when we asked Nancy Pelosi, she loves to come here, and one time we asked her who her great political mentor was, and she tears up and talks about Leo T. McCarthy, uh, who was a USF alum, and Leo was an amazing guy. And we have the McCarthy Center here to promote the idea that all of our students should learn to become engaged citizens. Um, how about you? Who is your, some of your great political heroes? Who, who were some of the people, or maybe the person, who really deeply inspired you to walk the walk you're doing now? So I, re I remember the first meeting that I went to that um, Jerry Adams and actually Mark McGuinness, both of them addressed. Um, and I remember thinking, these really have their act together. I mean, it, was, it would have been in the, the early years of ceasefire and, and, and all of that. And I remember thinking, I, I mean, I come from a very Republican family. So my family, my mother, my grandmother in particular, hugely influential in how I think and how, so that's the, 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 the background. But um, Sinn Féin itself was more organized in the north than in the south. It was small, it was, I mean, there had been censorship, partition, all of which did its, its work very effectively. So I remember my, the first occasion that I heard them speak. And I think from that day to this, and certainly Martin now is no longer with us, but, but I would have to cite both of those uh, men as not, not just um, inspiration, but mentors. I mean, I, was, I felt, I feel that our generation were kind of privileged to serve an apprenticeship at times when the stakes were very high um, and we had access and, and learning, you know, in scenarios, negotiations, dealing with the, the British, but also dealing with, with our own constituency and our own people and learning how to bring people with you. I mean, very, very crucial stuff. So that has been hugely valuable. And I dare say, if you, if you had Pierce Doherty or Owen O'Brien or others kind of, of of my political generation, I imagine that they would cite that as well. But here's also the truth. Sinn Féin is a huge organization, and it, it's always been a collective leadership. So I could cite for you 30, 40, 50 people who were inspired, and who I still regard, by the way, as mentors. You know, people that I still regard as, as those that would guide you or give you a steer. Um, and some of them are of, of, my, of my own generation. They're not all necessarily old timers, you know? But that's a great thing. It's a great thing to have that, that sense of um, purpose and, and learning from people. It's really, really important. It's important that we pass that on and that you bring people along with you, you know? Uh, one of the things that's so noticeable now in Ireland and, and in this country, uh, women have taken mm -hmm. up positions of leadership, authority, responsibility. Uh, how do you see that as playing into this pivotal moment in Irish history that, that women have begun to come to the fore? I think it's not a day too soon. <laughs> and I also think, and if you're sure of nothing else, be sure of this. 
We're not getting a, a United Ireland without Irish mammies. Not happening. <laughs> it's just not happening. So Irish women, I mean, it, it, in some ways, Irish society has always kind of been matriarchal, hasn't it? And I, I, certainly in my experience over the years as an activist and involved in political life, any community you would go into, particularly when things got really tight, the women were to the forefront. And it, certainly in, in the course of the troubles in the north, and everybody got it hard. Don't please don't get me wrong. A lot of people, you know, suffered deeply. Um, but scenario after scenario, you see where the, the women come up trumps and dig deep, and were the glue holding families and holding entire communities together in very very difficult circumstances. But the truth is that despite all of our wonderful attributes and our heroism and, as, and all of that, we, we're just outside of, the, of that kind of public leadership space. And that's, again, an issue of power. It's an issue of influence. And it's also a very deeply cultural thing around how we understand who leaders are, what do they look like. And for a long time, let's face it, leaders didn't rock in in stiletto heels wearing red lipstick. Do you know what I mean? That was not the kind of, you know, identity kit. There were men of a certain posture, a certain class even, of a certain... So it, it's taken time to kind of break that down. I'm really pleased that we have a majority of Sinn Féin assembly members now in the North are women. Mm -hmm. We've got past 50%, which is a great achievement. Um, and, and in the Oireachtas, in the Dáil, we're not at 50%, but we're not far off. But we have very, very strong representation. And for us, it's not tokenistic. It's not about being in there to take the bad look off things or to, as they say, add color. And they say, you know, women, they say they add color. And you say, I always just say, what does that mean that I'm a girl? So I'm bringing color because you're not male. So it's, it's not a cosmetic thing. It has to be really about women ourselves stepping up and saying, we want, we demand our space. I mean, Nancy Pelosi is a sterling example of that. But then it's also about the system accommodating us on our terms, on our terms. To, to be part of, of that. We still have a journey in Ireland, but I think we have. You're right, we've made great stri uh, strides. And there's huge talent, just immense talent across society. So we need to tap into, tap into that. Uh, the, the Jesuit universities in Mexico and in Latin America, South America, have started a, um, an observatory of democracy. And Latin America reached a, a high point of democratic culture in about 2000 and since then has seen the rise of authoritarianism and just a lack of, a growing lack of confidence uh, in democracy itself among voters. Um, Ireland is rated as one of the most strong democratic cultures in the world. Now, the Irish had to save civilization in the eighth century, in the seventh century. I think it's time. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> How can Ireland you know, teach us? I mean, we've had our troubles here in this country with our democracy. We are currently in a crisis of, of sort of confidence in democratic institutions, confidence in democratic culture, confidence in democracy. Uh, what can Ireland teach us uh, in this moment? I think the most profound and important thing that we can do as a country is to finish our journey. See, because I think the successful completion of the Irish peace process, which is the reunification of the island, ending division, creating a united Ireland, is proof positive, as I said in my opening remarks, that even the most intractable conflicts have answers if you work in common purpose, if you have resilience, if you have stamina, if you have creativity and generosity and humility. So I don't think Ireland, I would not be suggesting that Ireland goes around like some kind of moon chore, you know, it teaches preaching to the world, you know, how to get things right, because God knows sometimes we've gotten things very badly wrong. But I, I think successfully navigating the end of our story 
I think is the most profound thing that we can do because that says to the world community, actually, it's worth persisting. Actually, it's worth being creative and generous and carrying yourself with the level of humility. I think secondly for us as Irish people, we need to be true to who we are. Like we have to be true to the experience of our nation. So in European terms, we're a little bit of an outlier because a lot of our European uh, partners, our wonderful partners, they were colonizers. They were everywhere, let's face it. Mm -hmm. We were colonized. We were on the far end of that experience. We need to be very, very true to that. So for example, we are a neutral, non-aligned state. That is how we must stay. That's, if we're gonna bring something to the table, if we are gonna actually make a contribution to world diplomacy, to betterment of the world, you have to actually be who you are and true to your experiences. So I am very much against the idea that we have to catch up and play with the big guys. And we're, we're, we're never going to be a hard military power. Like that's not happening. That doesn't need it. That's not what we bring. So I, I, I think if, if we manage to get those things right, being true to who we are, finishing out our, our uh, story with, with humility and in cooperation with, with international partners, I think that's the best way that we, we build that sense of confidence in, around that change can happen. You know, you hear people say very often, politicians, they're all the same. Like, why bother? I mean, that's the most devastating, isn't it? <laughs> Commentary on, yeah. on public life. So we need to demonstrate that actually we can succeed and that we can, we can, we can achieve a big goal. And I think that inspires people, I hope. A, a last question, is we, we have a standard last question uh, for all of our guests. And you've been a wonderful guest. And, and thank you so much for inspiring us, informing us, challenging us, um, and enlisting us. Um, in, in, this, in this great cause of peace and justice. Um, any advice you might have? We have uh, current students here in the audience. We have students online, and we have students who will be viewing this later uh, as part of their classes. Words of advice for, for the University of San Francisco's uh, students. Mm. OK, so I, I have to say I have a, a daughter who's just started her university education who would be mm -hmm. horrified that her mother's advice is being enlisted <laughs> to the great <laughs> students of this university or any other. Um, I, I suppose the first, looking back to my own experience of, of learning and life and, and being at, at, at university, the first thing I would say is enjoy the experience. Like, um, because you, you get in this part of your life, whether you're coming out of high school or, you know, or whether you're coming, you're slightly older and it's, you, you know, you're, you're returning to education, a space to actually think. That's a great thing. You know, that's kind of when you get caught into the, the humdrum and the speed and the pace of life and keeping up and, you know, very often you're left time poor. Hmm. So you have now this, this moment and this space uh, to think and to, to be yourself fully, to be fully, fully yourself and to challenge. And I know there's faculty members here, challenge all of them, challenge yourself um, and aim for, for excellence. I, I say to people who matter to me, to my own kids, um, the important thing in life is that you find your star. Yeah. Find your star and follow your star. That's, that's the essence of a life of meaning, I, I believe. Mary Lou McDonald, thank you. Good. Have you met your consul general? Yes, me Hall, yeah. Uh, yeah. We should have acknowledged that the consul general is here. I'm only spotting you now. Me Hall, if you want to say hello, yes. You're very welcome. Very, very welcome. Good. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.
Yeah, this is 